Well, amen. Let's take our Bibles this evening, and if you'll join me in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 2 is where we'll find our text tonight. 1 Corinthians and chapter number 2 is where we'll find our text verses this evening, and it certainly has been a wonderful day here in the Lord's house. We're thankful for two that followed the Lord in believers' baptism this morning, and we certainly rejoice uh, in that, and uh, just excited about what the Lord is doing here in our midst, and um, again, thankful for the opportunity we also have to honor mothers today and, and to honor that role uh, in, our, uh, in our lives, in our culture, and uh, certainly in our church. If you found your place in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, I'd invite you to stand if you're physically able as we read the Scripture tonight. Uh, 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, we're going to begin reading in verse number 6, and we're down through the end of the chapter. The Bible says, How be it, we speak wisdom among, men, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this night, and Lord, for already what has been accomplished in this service. Thankful for the music. We're thankful for... Uh, families uh, coming together to honor the Lord through their faithful church attendance. We thank you for those that contributed uh, through their giving uh, into the offering. We thank you for the choir and the orchestra and just so many wonderful, wonderful things. And now, Lord, as we come to the conclusion of this day of ministry effort and of labor and of growth, we pray that you would, uh, Lord, do a work in our hearts. Draw us closer to thee, we pray. Use this message. Help me. Fill me as I attempt to deliver what you've laid on my heart. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The title of the message tonight is The Wisdom of God. I suppose as you were uh, reading along with me as I was reading, you picked up on that terminology or that word quite often in these 10 or 11 verses that we have. The word wisdom is seen over and over and over again. And of course, as we go back to the beginning of this uh, series that we began a, a while ago in the book of 1 Corinthians, this church at Corinth, we understand uh, that Corinth was a city located in Greece, and Greece was a, uh, was, a, was a country at that point in time. It was a group of people that was, uh, that was fascinated with learning and uh, with knowledge, and, and this was the, uh, this was the great, uh, this was the great uh, goal in life was to become as wise, humanly wise, filled with wisdom as you could possibly get. And so here's a church that's growing up in the midst of this type of culture. And uh, the Apostle Paul is trying to set them straight that it's not the wisdom of this world that we're seeking after, but it's, a, uh, it's the wisdom of God, which is so much better to build our lives upon. You know, the wisdom of this world is constantly changing. We see that in the day and age in which we're living in. Things that were perhaps uh, 100 years ago were considered wise. Uh, Tonight, they're considered foolishness. Uh, Things that at one time were considered normal and and culturally acceptable, and and, and boy, if you got your life set up in this way, you're good. Uh, Tonight, people would sneer at you as as, as they uh, consider that that, that's no longer what, what we hold to as a culture and as a society. That's so 90s, that's so 80s, that's so 70s, you know, or whatever decade that you want to that you want to categorize that as such. But listen to me, if you build your life upon the wisdom of God, the wisdom of this book, you will not listen, you'll never go out of style. 
Not with God at least. The world might look at you and think you're crazy and might think you're nuts. But God will always uh, bless you and, and, and God's wisdom never changes. And so that's the emphasis that the Apostle Paul is trying to make. And he's trying to, again, encourage this church because they're dwelling in the midst of this culture and it is challenging uh, for them, no doubt. Now this, uh, just a week and a half or so ago, uh, my children came home from school and uh, they all had what, are, what we know as progress reports. And, um, and, and I can remember back in my day when progress reports came out, uh, I tried to hide them from my parents. I did not want them to see um, you know, what I had done or perhaps what I had not done. And, uh, and they normally had to say, hey, go get it. We want to see it. Um, my children, on the other hand, had nothing to hide. I, see, I had some things to hide. Uh, my children at this point in time don't have anything to hide, and they brought me their prog- uh, progress reports, and I was, I was astounded, very, to be very honest, and I was very proud of my children in that they were all uh, had attained either the merit or the honor roll, and the reason why I was so astounded is because I'm their father. <laughs> and uh, to, to, to just, to, just to shoot straight with you tonight and to be very frank with you, I think, um, I think maybe after my first grade year, I don't believe I ever saw the merit roll or the honor roll the rest of my uh, career as a, uh, as a student. And uh, I don't suppose maybe it was because I couldn't. Maybe it was more because I, I, I was interested in other things or, uh, you know, maybe didn't want to apply myself. I did have some uh, subjects that were somewhat of a struggle to me. But I was, I was thrilled. I was proud of my kids. And listen, I want my children to be wise and to achieve good grades. I think all of us do. There's nothing wrong with that, doing your best. In fact, that's Bible, right? Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do with all thy might. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So I'm not, a, I'm not opposed at all to, to our children getting good grades. I think they ought to work hard and, and do their best. I want them to be successful in life. I want them to be successful in education. I want them to be successful in their career. But listen, above all of these things, above all of these things, I long for my children to be confronted with to be receivers of and to be impacted by the wisdom of God. In other words, if my children have uh, have all, all the things down as far as an earthly education are concerned, but do not know God, then we failed as parents. We have failed to pass along uh, to our children the faith that was once delivered unto us. Now, as Paul introduces this letter to the church at Corinth, Again, a church that was faced with its own share of problems. He speaks of his ministry philosophy early in this chapter of Second, or 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. And I want us to consider his ministry philosophy. I think this is a good philosophy for us as well. Notice that as he ministered to them, he ministered to them in three ways. Number one, he ministered to them with simplicity. Look in verse number one. He came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. He says, listen, I did not come to you with incredible speech and amazing words that would astound you and would blow someone away with just how smart I sounded. No, he says, listen, I came to you in simplicity. He says, I did not come with with the speech that the world is, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, Paul understood that the Corinthians, the church at Corinth, that the uh, Corinthian people were won by the temporary power and ability that he could manufacture. He, re- he realized that, listen, that, that would not keep them. But if instead they would be won to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God, he understood that this, this would enable them to weather all of the storms that might come in life. And you know, we, we can, as a, as a church, we can try to manipulate and we can try to, you know, to set up our, our services so that when people come, they, they feel feelings and, and uh, you know, there's a certain mood that is set here and, and uh, we, we do little gimmicks and we do little tricks or we can just fall down on our face before God and say, God, give us more of your Holy Spirit. He said that's the way to, uh, to, to accomplish message and his ministry. And we find here that he disdains the wisdom of the world an excellency of speech. Instead, he emphasizes a desire to speak wisdom among them that are perfect in verse number six. We might ask ourselves, well, what exactly does that mean? That just simply means uh, that it is a reference to those that are spiritually mature and biblically minded Christians. Most often when you find the word perfect in the Bible as it pertains to a mortal man, you're going to find that the Bible is speaking about a maturity or a completeness in life. Uh, in other words, when, when we see the word perfect, we often think of no mistakes, no errors, no problems whatsoever. 
And the, and the, Bible, the Bible definition of perfect, as far as it pertains to man, just means complete. It just means mature or whole. And so he writes to this church and he says, I long to you, all right, verse number six, speak wisdom among them that are perfect. This was his goal, this was his desire. But those of us that know the church at Corinth know that he was having a hard time attaining that goal. We'll find, and we won't, we're not getting there tonight, but in chapter number three, he says, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. He said, I, I couldn't speak unto you as unto God, many of you for decades. Not, not, only, uh, not only been saved that long, but you've been in this church that long, and you have been functioning, some of you, in the same ministry that long. And so as a, as a whole, I feel like when I stand to preach <clears throat> to the Cleveland Baptist Church, I can, I can speak the wisdom of God unto you because I, I sense that there is, a, there is a completeness. But what about you on the individual level? When somebody comes to you and they begin to talk about spiritual things and begin to try to, uh, to speak unto you wisdom, the wisdom of God, is it, is it difficult for you to grasp? Are you more taken with other things, more captivated by other things? It could be that that reveals uh, the fact that you have not yet reached that level of perfection uh, that, that Paul is, is desiring in those that he is wanting to minister to. Can you speak spiritual wisdom to your children? Can you speak spiritual wisdom uh, to your Sunday school class, to your church friends and acquaintances? This was the goal of Paul, but it's also the goal of God for believers that we would be mature to the point that we can receive the wisdom of God even though we be mortal men. Now, I, want us to, I want us to discover together tonight what the wisdom of God is, first of all, because it's found here. And then I want us to consider how it is revealed to us because that too is found here. And then lastly, as we finish together tonight, I want us to consider the impact that the wisdom of God makes in our lives. Now first of all, we have to ask ourselves the question, well what is the wisdom of God? And I would say number one, God's wisdom is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Now we heard the choir sing tonight, we preach Christ, and we heard a beautiful special about raising our children for Jesus. And I just wanna go on record tonight and say I'm thankful to be in a church that still lifts up the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, really, we have no other message to preach but him. And when it comes to the wisdom of God, what is the wisdom of God? It is nothing other than the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, as you behold the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, you, you are beholding more than just a mortal man. Now, Jesus was a man, but, but you're beholding more than just a man. And we look at him and we say, well, he just looks like a man. But listen, as you study his life, and as you consider his words, his deeds, his actions, the things that he did, the power that he possessed, I want you to know something. When you and I look at the person of Jesus Christ, we are looking at the very wisdom of God. Now, that is an unmistakable theme here in these verses, verses 6 through 8. And I want us to consider the wisdom of God found in the person of Jesus Christ. We see, first of all, that he was veiled throughout history. Throughout the Old Testament, Jesus Christ was veiled. Look in verse number 7. He says this, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. The Old Testament is understood by the New Testament. Now, Christ is seen throughout the Old Testament even though his name is never mentioned there. Now think about this. Jesus himself said the following in John 5 in verse number 39. He said this, search the scriptures. Well, you ask yourselves a question. Well, during the lifetime of Christ, what were the scriptures? And it was simply Genesis through Malachi. That was all that they had. The gospels had not been written. The Pauline epistles had not been written. So Jesus is hearkening them back to the Old Testament. He says, search the scriptures. Now what do you think you're going to find there? Well, listen to what he says. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Notice, and they are they which testify of me. He said to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter number 24, verses 25 to 27, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. Again, what scriptures were available for them at that point? Just the Old Testament. So he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. 
Now we might he is seen in every place, and he actually makes some pre-incarnate appearances throughout the Old Testament, as in the story there in Genesis chapter 17 with Abraham and Sarah. Uh, I believe that just before the battle with Jericho that Joshua beheld the face of the Lord Jesus Christ in Joshua chapter 5, verse number 13 through Joshua 6 and verse number 2. I believe that it was Jesus that appeared to announce that Samson was going to be born to his parents in Judges chapter number 13, verses 2 through 25. We find several instances of Jesus Christ appearing. He's referred to as the angel of the Lord or the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, but we find, that the, uh, we, we find that the Lord Jesus Christ made some pre-incarnate appearances. You know, his coming to this earth was predicted at least 65 times throughout the Old Testament, beginning with God's promise that a male child would be born and would crush the head of the serpent or the devil with his life and power there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. You know, the prophets predicted, they predicted what town he would be born in according to Micah 5.2, that he would be born of a virgin, according to Isaiah 7.14, and that he would be served by a forerunner, John the Baptist, according to Isaiah 40, verses 3 to 5, and Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 1. All I'm simply saying is, is if you dig in to this book, you can discover the hidden, the hidden and the, the mysterious wisdom of God, and it's in the person of Jesus Christ. Now you search for him, and of course we have the, old, the New Testament at our, our disposal that helps us to see and, and to notice these things, but we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. Notice not only that he was veiled throughout history, the Old Testament, he was unknown by great men. He was unknown by great men. To them, he was a mystery. To them, he remained hidden. They could not see him for who he really was. Look with me in verse number eight, if you would. The Bible says this which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Oh, imagine Jesus Christ. He stood before them. They beheld him with their own physical eyes. They heard him with their own ears. They handled him with their own hands. And yet they disregarded him. They missed who he was. He was unknown to them. And the Bible says, had they known who he was, had they known where he came from and the power and authority that he had and his love for them, they would never have done what they did. He was unknown by great men. But can I say thirdly that he is glory to those of us who are perfect. You know, the world and its leaders, the princes of this world, they look at Jesus and they sneer and they laugh and they mock and they scorn. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to build your life around some some man that lived 2,000 years ago that maybe taught some, some interesting things and maybe did some interesting things in his life, but you're going to live, you're going to build your life around a, a man that's been gone for 2,000 2, years? Oh, no, you need to build your life around the things that are the here and now, the things that are happening. You need to build your life around our wisdom. But listen, for those of us that are perfect, he is our glory. That's, that is who we want to build our life around. We make no apologies for that. Look again in verse number six. The Bible says, How be it, we speak wisdom among them who are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes. Look in verse number seven. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. You know what I glory in tonight? I don't glory in the fact that I'm a, I'm a good person or I'm not a good person or whatever the case might be. That, I don't take glory in that. I don't take glory in, in the fact that I've, been, that I've been called to preach or anything. Listen, listen. If I, if I take glory in anything, I need to take glory in Jesus Christ. He, he is our glory, that God ordained him unto our glory. Now that when we, when we look at our lives, we don't want to see ourselves. We don't want, listen, but listen, don't, don't put yourself up. Put yourself up as an example. Hey, look at me. Well, listen, here's what we can do. We can put Jesus Christ up. For the Bible says that if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto himself. See, for far too long, we as Christians, we've lifted ourselves up. We've lifted, we, we've lifted our pastors up and our evangelists up. Hey, look at, look at this guy. Now listen, I'm not saying that we ought not to follow the example that they set, but, but at the end of the day, listen, I, I'm not following a man. And you ought not to follow a man. We, we follow Jesus Christ. And if we lift him up, oh, he will, he will draw men unto himself. We'll never, we'll never go wrong by lifting up Jesus. And so we see here that Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. It is the person of Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice there's a second thought that's found here, and that is that God's wisdom is revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. 
So we find that God's wisdom is found in the person of Jesus Christ. But how do, we, how do we know who Jesus Christ is? How do we come to the point where we place our faith and trust in him? Because he's revealed to us by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice he turns to verse number nine. And we discover here our inability to grasp the wonders of God. Our inability to grasp the wonders of God. Look in verse number nine, but it, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Amen. You know, our eyes have not seen, our ears have not heard, and our mind can't possibly comprehend the awesome wonder of God and what he has prepared for us in the heavens. You know, being a pastor, I spend quite a bit of time with, with people who are hurting and grieving, particularly after they've lost a loved one. You know, we go to funerals and, and we go to funeral homes and we, we do our best to try to, to try to whisper and speak hope into those who have lost someone that is near and dear to them. And I'm afraid that we, far, we fall so far short. You know, we try in our minds, we try to imagine what heaven must be like. But you know, according to verse number nine, we can't even begin to comprehend. Our, our eyes can't even begin to, I mean, our eyes have never behold, have beheld something like this. Our ears have never, have never heard something so, our, our mind cannot, and, and, and we try to, and again, we try to conjure up things in, in our minds to, to think of what it must be like. And I'm here to tell you that according to the Bible, heaven and the wonders and splendor of God, the awesome majesty and his holiness and his power, you and I can't even begin to describe it, not even just a little bit. Now, that's what the Bible says. Amen. You know, I got to thinking uh, about this idea that, you know, finite beings, which is all of us, could never we could never even conjure up infinity and eternality. You, you and I, we, we can't, we, this, this, is how, this is how we know that the Bible is not made up. Because, because people that have a beginning and that have an end, we can't figure out, nor can we describe something that, that we could never make up something that has no beginning and has no ending. Amen. I challenge you, not, not right now, but I challenge you sometime to try to think about eternity. You can't. Your, your mind can't comprehend it. And you're, you're, you, you, you and I know, know nothing of something that is eternal. It is, this is not something that we could make up or that we could discover on our own. You know, recently I was, I was um, looking into the, the children of Israel at the crossing of the Red Sea for something that I was doing, uh, some teaching that I was doing. And I was reminded that the children of, the, of Israel at the crossing of the Red Sea, they could have never dreamed how God was going to deliver them. I mean, I mean they, they could not have possibly figured that out on their own. They had come to the edge of that body of water, and they looked behind them, and here comes the Egyptian army. And, and, they, and they, never, they never could have dreamed that God was going to make a way the way that he did. That he was going to create a highway through this, through this body of water? No chance. Now, now, now they, could, they could have thought a lot of things. In fact, they did think a lot of things. First and foremost on their minds, they thought, we're going to die here. Either that or we're going to be taken back into captivity. We're going right back to where we came from. And I'm, I'm supposing if some of them had faith enough to believe God's going to get us out of this. I don't think there were too many that did. But if some did, they would have thought, well, the, the, the last time God delivered us, he sent some plagues. So maybe that's what he's going to do to this army behind us. He's going to plague them, and he's going to get rid of them somehow. But they could, they could never have dreamed that God was going to create this highway in the sea. Why? why? Because that, that, that's not something that, that, that you and I would ever dream up. And, and I, you know, by the way, I have found that the deliverances of God usually are not anything that we think they're going to be. Amen. In our minds, we think to ourselves, okay, I've come to this thing, and I believe God's going to get me out, and here's how he's going to do it. And nine times out of ten, I'm wrong. In more cases than that, probably 10 times out of 10, I'm wrong. I think, okay, here's what God's gonna do. And many times, God does nothing of the sort. God, God's ways are so much higher than our ways. So when we think about eternity, listen, you and I, you and I could never have come up with this, with this thought, with this idea. We could never have come up with this plan. This is why I'm saying this is the wisdom of God. This is not the wisdom of man, but it's the wisdom of God. Listen, whatever the world thinks of God is most likely completely wrong. When the world tries to figure out God, when they try to describe him, when they try to, 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 to point us to him, here's what, here's what we think God looks like. And we've seen some of the generalizations and some of the characteristics that they give to God. Some of it is blasphemous. Some of it is very careless and casual. 
Listen to me, what the world thinks of life after death is most likely completely wrong because with these feeble eyes and ears and minds, we cannot imagine what God has prepared. So how, how do we know the wisdom of God? According to the Bible, the Holy Spirit reveals it to us. Look in verses 10 and 11. It says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. How, how, did, how, did, these, how did these men sit down and write down what, what heaven would be like and the fact that God is eternal and that he had a son and that here was God's divine plan? How, how did they write those things? The Bible tells us. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And listen to me, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna have the wisdom of God in your life, it's not, going to, it's not going to come because you work really hard at it. It's not going to come because you, you, know, you exhaust yourself trying to pursue it. Listen, if you get the wisdom of God tonight, you're going to get it through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, look, now look what it says in, in verse, number, verse number 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit, but the spirit of God. So we see here the intimacy of the Spirit's revelation. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God. And by the way, there are two words of God that we discover in the Bible. The first word of God that we discover is the living and physical Word, and we would call Him Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit, listen, he, he, he reveals truth to us. He reveals wisdom to us through the person of Jesus Christ. We already said that, right? That Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God according to the early part of this, of this text. But there's a second aspect that he uses to reveal truth to us or to reveal the word to us, and that is the living written word. Now I want you to know something. Just as Jesus was alive and still is alive, this book is alive. And, and it still is alive. It is living today. This book is a living book. It's the most unique book you and I will ever, will ever hold in our hands. It's the most unique book that we'll ever read because this book is alive. Now, this book's author is still living. And so, and so the Holy Spirit of God uses, uh, uses two things to communicate truth or reveal truth or wisdom to us. He uses the physical word, Jesus, and he uses the written word, the Bible, to reveal, reveal wisdom and truth to men. Now listen, there are two places that you will find truth today. You will either find it in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you will find it in the pages of Scripture. You won't find it anywhere else. You're not going to find that on Fox News. I hate to break that to you. Uh, you're not going to find it there. Some of, us need, some of us need to turn Fox News off. <laughs> if we spend as much time in this book and meeting with Jesus face to face as we spent watching Fox News, you know, and we say, well, that, yeah, but they have a little bit more of a closer, listen, listen, that, that, that's not wisdom. That's insanity, Amen. all right? That, that, that's, that's the wisdom of man. But listen, when you open up this book, you discover the wisdom of God. That's where you're gonna find it. Listen, when you, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you discover the wisdom of God. Amen. It's possible there's someone here tonight who's never been saved. And you've been functioning in this life, and maybe you've been doing pretty well for yourself, but you've been functioning in this life in your own wisdom, in your own strength. Maybe you've made something out of your life. You've accomplished some things. But listen to me, you have not, you have not accomplished anything apart from the Lord Jesus Christ that would be of eternal value. You need to meet the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find, you'll find truth in those two places. All truth emanates from these two sources. And these two sources, listen, they agree completely. It boggles my mind that there are some people, and maybe, they, maybe they're saved, and they'll come and they'll try to say something like this. Well, Jesus came to me, and he, Jesus, Jesus wants me to do this, and it doesn't agree with the Bible. Now, I don't mean to be unkind, and I, I, I normally try to handle it a little bit more politically correct than what I'm gonna tell you tonight, but I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that if somebody comes to me and they tell me that Jesus or the Holy Spirit has told them something contrary to this book, they're a liar. Amen. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit will never tell you something contrary to this book. Because listen, the, the written word and the living word are the same. Jesus, Jesus Christ is the word of God, just as the Bible is the word of God. Those two will never disagree. So, so, so don't try to introduce new doctrine into this church or into your, into your life that disagrees with what this book says and claim, well, Jesus appeared to me and Jesus taught me this. That's, not, that's simply not true. Jesus will never lead you contrary 
to his word. And so we see here, how, how, do, how do we get, how do we get the, the, the wisdom revealed to us? Through the Holy Spirit. Now listen, let me ask you this question. What makes the Spirit of God equipped to reveal this to us? Well, the answer is given. The Spirit is equipped to reveal the wisdom of God because he is God. Amen. That's what he says in verse, in verse number 11. J- just as you know your deepest secrets. Listen, no one in this room knows you better than you know yourself. Now, now some of you have been married for 50, 55, 60 years. And you think to yourself, you know, man, my husband knows me better than anybody, and he may, but he doesn't know you better than yourself. I guarantee you there are some, there, there are some, there, there are some things that you have not yet communicated to your spouse of decades. Some thoughts that you think, maybe some fears, maybe some flaws that you have, maybe some failures that you have, and you harbor them inside. No one else knows about them, but you know about them. And what, what, man, what, what man knows the spirit of man more than a man himself? No one does. And he turns that around and he says, or what, who knows the spirit of God more than God himself does? And so, so the Holy Spirit of God is, is, is capable, he is equipped, he is able to reveal this truth to us because he is God. And so we understand that that's what makes him capable of revealing this truth to us. Let's finish tonight with this third, final thought. Notice number three, God's wisdom received impacts a man completely. God's wisdom received impacts a man completely. We've considered, okay, what is the wisdom of God? It's the person of Jesus Christ. How is the wisdom of God revealed to us? It's revealed to us through the person of the Holy Spirit. Because he's God, he is able to reveal this truth to us. Now, thirdly, what difference does it make in my life? And it ought to make a difference. It ought to make a huge, huge difference in your life. First of all, number one, notice that the wisdom of God received impacts a man in that it impacts their spirit. It impacts their spirit. Look at verse number 12. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Have you ever, have you ever met someone you spent just a minute or two with them and you walked away and said, I bet that person's a Christian. It's just, just a way they carry themselves, just a way that they communicate. Maybe there's, it's a way that they dress. And you walk away and say, I bet that person is a Christian. Why? Because they don't have the spirit of the world. They have the spirit of God. Amen. And their spirit bears witness with our spirit. That when we, get, when we get impacted and receive the wisdom of God, that, we, that it impacts our spirit. Listen, I, I'm here to tell you that I, I still believe Christians should act differently. That Christians should look different and should be different because the spirit inside of us is not of this world. Amen. And we're living in a generation in which Christians are trying to get as close to the world as they possibly can. And the, and the problem is, is, that, is, is that, listen, you no longer have the spirit of the world living inside of you. You have the spirit of God living inside of you. And you ought to be looking and aiming and, and shooting for something so much higher than just the spirit of this world. How can I be like this world? No, no. Listen, the spirit of God says, how can I be more like Jesus? How can I talk more like him? How can I act more like him? How can I show love like him and have compassion like he had it and show mercy and grace? Notice it impacts not only their spirit, but it impacts their speech. Look in verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know, Paul emphasizes that his speech is not a speech that can be learned by the human mind but it is a speech with the, which the Holy Ghost imparts to the believer. You know, I, I just personally believe no believer should ever feel inadequate to share their faith. Now, now there's a lot of Christians that use that excuse. And so what they'll do is they'll call brother so-and-so, hey, can you come and can you share your faith with my neighbor, with my coworker? And I just want you to know something. Listen, if you'll take a step of faith and you'll just believe God, you, you need to get in this book, and you need to study this book, but if you'll take a step of faith, I believe that the Holy Spirit of God will give you the words that you need to say. Because when we, listen, when we open up our mouths as, as believers, and we're, we're trying to communicate the gospel, we're trying to communicate the wisdom of God, listen, these are not, these are not words that we could conjure up anyways. These are, these are words that the Holy Ghost teaches us. He gives us the, wor- the words to say. And I'm just here to tell you that there's, there's so many Christians out there today that shy away from sharing the word of God and, and, and maybe standing up and communicating in some way, whether it's one-on-one or with, whether it's in a teaching type setting. And, and, and I'm here to tell you that if, you'll, if, if you just believe this is what God would have me to do and you'll get up and do it, I believe that God will give you the words to say. 
I believe that he'll, he'll teach you what you need to know. That, you'll, that, you, that your mouth, listen, your mouth can be something that the Holy Ghost fills with words that come from him. And I think that when you understand that truth, it's found right here in Scripture. Notice we see not only does it impact our spirit, it impacts our speech, but it impacts our mind. Look in verse number 16. For who hath chosen the mind of the Lord, that he may, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Philippians 2, 5 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Oh, listen, Christian, we need to be different tonight. Because listen, when, the, when, we can, when we're confronted with the wisdom of God and we accept it, we receive it, it changes us completely. It impacts our spirit, it impacts our speech, and it impacts our mind. Amen. So, what does the wisdom of God teach us? It teaches us three things. Number one, The wisdom of God teaches us Jesus is truly a great savior. That's what the wisdom of God teaches. We get, listen, you and I, when you got saved, you got more than just salvation from hell. You got more than just salvation from hell. You got forgiveness of sin, but you also got the wisdom that you need to live productive and pleasing lives in him every single day. that's That's what Christ gave us. We got the wisdom of God. He is such a great savior. He does not just, okay, well, I'm gonna give you eternal life, and that's all you get. No, no, he gives us blessing. He he gives us the filling of the Holy Spirit. He gives us wisdom from which to build our lives around. He gives us a new purpose, a new goal. He gives us so much more. He gives us good and and, and precious gifts that come from above. Jesus is truly a great Savior. But notice, secondly, I believe that the wisdom of God teaches the Holy Spirit is truly a great teacher. The Holy Spirit of God is truly a great teacher. You know, the Bible says about the pastor that he must be one who is apt to teach. And so I I would hope that I am capable in some respects of being able to teach you something from God's word. But I want you to know something. I'm a pathetic teacher in comparison to the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, listen, he, he wants to teach you some things. He wants to impart some truth to you. He is truly a great teacher. He teaches us that which we could never have learned on our own using the physical word and using the written word to accomplish this task. The Holy Spirit is a great teacher. But notice thirdly, we learn this when we consider the wisdom of God that the Christian life is truly a great life. We have more than eternal life in the heavens, but we also have a new spirit, a new speech, and a new mind. I'm thankful for the wisdom of God. The world is constantly trying to draw us in, constantly trying to say, hey, go follow after this, discover this, search this, know this. And I'm thankful that there's something so much greater than the wisdom of this world that leaves us empty, Longing for more. Solomon said it's just vanity. But listen, you fill your life up with the wisdom of God. This book, the relationship with Jesus Christ, and he will satisfy your every longing and your every need.